Hello and welcome to On Landscape. Uh, in the previous issue of our Capture One series, we were looking at a single picture from Joe's trip to Egg. In this series, we're going to quickly look at a set of five images uh, and show what Joe had previously post-processed. And we're going to try and reproduce those changes on a raw version of the file. Is that correct, Joe? Well, something like that, Tim, and or, or at least what we can do is look at uh, a raw state version uh, and um, and a final edited version, and we can then basically backward engineer uh, the, uh, the the workflow. But I'd also really like, to, if I may, uh, to emphasise some of the thinking uh, behind the editing, um, and and it's an opportunity for me actually to try to articulate what uh, and why. I edit in a particular way, and I, I hope that that will be insightful. Brilliant. If we so, if we start here, we can see that the right hand is slightly, slightly confusing me. The right hand version is the unprocessed one. Uh, it's the uh, the one that was uh, we made a variant of. So it's the effectively more or less unedited raw file, uh, whereas the left hand version is uh, is the edited version, and um, which I have. I produced it, in fact, a month or so ago. And also, just before we go any further, you can see that the browser is at the bottom. And I'd just like to show how, uh, in Capture One, if you want to, you can displace the browser to the left or to the bottom, like that, but which is Command-Shift-B uh, as a, a quick uh, shortcut. Uh, and, and that means that for images where... Um, you want to sort of minimise the amount of ex excess space. Um, there, there are certain situations. Well, horizontals generally yeah, work better. Yeah, panoramas and horizontals, the bottom, yeah. yeah, exactly. So if we if we just consider this image uh, briefly, I remember when I was photographing it that um, I, I loved the the what I was I think trying to do is that initially I was drawn to the the lovely boulders in the foreground. Um, but it was it was well. How do you make something that develops that theme or builds it into the context in a in an articulate way, uh, an interesting way? Um, and I think, as I, I see it now, that there's a kind of holistic, overarching sort of structure where you see this rock here becomes the kind of critical endpoint from which the, the the sort of structural elements of the composition are drawn. Uh, and so that there is a, a kind of rotate, uh, well, let's call it a um, a circular pattern um, within within the image, and that that was the the concept, if you will. Um, so it's it draws us out and back and around, um, and the 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 space created by the flowing water helps to animate the the still elements of the image. Um, so. It's an image that is at least partially about colour, uh, otherwise I could have developed it in black and white. And we can see that the raw file itself, the colours are, are subdued. And as we discussed in our last episode, the, uh, the raw file is by its very nature quite flat. Yes. Um, so it's not surprising that when we look at the two together, um, we can see that the edited version has a much more animated color. And that is done by uh, increasing the saturation, by rebalancing a little bit uh, globally, um, and then by doing specific tweaks. Now, I'd just like to get rid of the browser completely by going Command-B there, so we can really focus on uh, this difference. And in fact, at this stage, I'm gonna go get rid of the tools um, column as well. So we can really, really focus on um, the two images together and, and perhaps try to isolate specific areas uh, that are particularly important. We can see that the increased saturation has really brought out um, the, the cyan tones. I would see maybe too much looking at them now. And one of the things about a process like this is I did the editing some months back or a month or two back. And, you know, with the now with the benefit of hindsight i'd probably be thinking hmm, i might actually just take that cyan here down a little bit so that it doesn't drag the eye as much as it is because you can see here it's it's a it's a good deal subtler uh, it's darker a little bit around this this edge particularly here that's been 
taken down, I suspect, with a layer. Yeah. We can also see that the the sky has been darkened. That looks much more like I remember it being. But nevertheless, it's still been uh, approached um, in its own terms. Is it important that it re records my memory or is it important that it records what works visually, what works as a kind of in terms of bringing the image alive? I think that's more of a philosophical dis yes. discussion. I'd like to I'd like to know your your views on that. But um, personally, I think it's probably a bit of both. It is. Yes, I think it's uh, it, for, for the type of work I, I see you doing. You need to relate to the subject, definitely. So, so too much departure from the subject and the moment would uh, would be jarring. I think. Absolutely. I, uh, one thing here, by the way, this is where um, we talked to. Uh, 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 before about the advantages of Capture One um, as a bit of editing software. Uh, um, one area that is absolutely brilliant is being able to compare and contrast. So at the moment, if we look at this little icon here, this is a multiple icon. It means yeah. you can have you can have anything up to a dozen images together on the main canvas. If you turn it off, you get one picture. And that's the primary one. It's the primary. So if I now go, okay, I'm going to click once on the right hand side. Sorry, I didn't click hard enough. <laughs> Back again. Um, there we go. And now we should just see the original raw file. You can yes. see how how flat it looks. That, that's not what I remember seeing by any stretch of the imagination. No, some might like it like that. It's not bad. Um, and the colours got a nice, cool, chilly quality. But if I think emotionally, my and I've now highlighted this one again. Um, you can see if we go back to that. It gives them a, a, a more immersive quality. So I suppose this is an area where we could think about how we use colour, um, you know, to draw um, the viewer. Uh, in, in the viewer, I, I must say, I try to not give that sort of third party language too much. For me, it is about my personal preference. Hmm. And and I because I love colour, I feel immersed. I want to feel immersed in the colour at the time. What I don't want to do is to make it so over the top that it loses that link with with what one might regard as one's collective sense of uh, true to nature. Yes. Um, yes. You know, without without making uh, that too much of a kind of ethical issue, it's about what works in its own sense. So does it does it does it seem believable to me? Well, I I think it does. But you know, maybe different screens that look slightly different. In fact, I've found I don't know if you found this at all, but if you plug a laptop into high resolution 100% um, RGB display, ISO, NEC, that sort of thing, yeah. you, you can often find the colour can look a little bit too much because what you see on the laptop is restrained by the sRGB colour space. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, Command T, bring this back our adjustment column, um, and at this stage let's have a quick look and see, wow, okay, quite a few layers there. So if we were to run through those layers, so we highlight the first one, um, and okay, so what's that done? That has darkened down these bright areas, and it looks like I must have used, if you look here, we can see brightness, yep. so is down significantly there, which I think is okay. Um, I think I re recall that, looking at it now, I might be inclined to think, I'd actually take the saturation down a little bit, there as well, um, just to take a little bit of the energy out of those areas. That might be too much. In fact, you can see how it's affecting in the middle of the image as well. Yes. So if we were to take an erase brush and then just remove it a second, maybe through here a bit. That's one of the nice things about about editing is you go back and change your decisions based on, you know, the maybe the slightly more detached view you have of it now, and I think I'd also probably just move into that area a little bit and just get the flow of light back into that zone. Okay, so that was layer one, layer two. We can see it is top right. Highlight in the top right, yeah. yes. So that's taking that down. Using Happy. contrast, I think, at the moment. I think that was, yeah, mainly with contrast. And let me just check high dynamic range and with highlight recovery. Mm. Yes. Happy with that one. Three is, see, that's bringing up shadow detail 
in the rocks in the central part of the image. And that looks like it's trying to make those rocks look more like the foreground rocks to the so there's a uniformity as you go backwards. To some extent, I agree with that, um, and it's also just to sort of open up the just get it breathing a little bit more. Let's say one could actually move some of that into that central uh, or a little bit further back. So let's say if we now were to we can see it might just take the flow back down on it a bit and uh, probably be inclined to think I ought to really run that back a little bit further in there as well. So I'm, I'm using a lower flow so it's not yeah. at 100% and I might also just ease the effect back a bit and I'm suspecting that's in high dynamic range. Yes. Shadow. Yep, shadow recovery so just pull it back a little bit. Um, or I might also reduce the contrast a little bit. Sometimes that can work. Just maybe bring the brightness up. Often it's just little tweaks in with these, you know, with with a bit of experience. Then um, the way the light responds, uh, you you develop your own way of, of using it. There's no right or wrong way. I I think one thing I would say that's possibly wrong though is to overdo shadow recovery. So if I just do that, we can see what happens. Yeah, you know, right shadow recovery is very powerful tool, but it it has a horrible way of, of working sometimes in, in Capture One. So I tend to keep shadow recovery quite low with Capture One in the sort of below, let's say, an increase of 30. Anything yeah. above that, it tends to become quite not that effective. Let's and say. I notice on Capture One that the use of contrast doesn't have the same darkening and lightening effect that it does in Lightroom and it's quite different. Photoshop. Yeah, so it really it's, is just a contrast. Yeah, it's really worth um, exploring with that a little bit and, and just getting to know the characteristics of the tools because no doubt that, that the Phase 1 team have have um, set up their their tools differently to Adobe. Okay, layer 4 is... Sometimes if I can't see what a layer is doing, I will do this. Just a drop down and always display mask. Ah, uh, there we yes. are. So it's just down there. Uh, so now if we turn it off again or put it on to only display when drawing we'll see we turn it off we can see that it's desaturated yeah we're desaturated because I find that very eye-catching yeah it's very strong that, that golden sort of yellow so we turned off the color there uh, being as it's right on the edge um, and this layer five well, we can see that's an increase in contrast for the foreground Yes. By the looks of it, yes. So it was saturation. Most of the actually. bottom half of the picture, yes. Yeah, yeah, saturation increase, which sort of has it given clarity as well? Let's see. Yes, taking clarity uh, okay. up. Yeah. Clarity and saturation. So sort of isolated. Probably I could have done that with contrast as well, but clarity uh, tends to emphasize structure and texture, whereas contrast is more of a kind of ambient light contrast. So. I guess that's what I felt was right so at the, the time. So the clarity will bring out some of the texture in the water as well, rather than just the darks and lights. Indeed, and also the highlight structures in the in the rocks, let's say. And then finally, layer six is the sky, and that's interesting. See what I've done? I've actually lightened it, but that includes the Isle of Rum. Yeah. I think the idea there is, I probably, I'm sure I used a graduated uh, ND filter, yeah. which was probably necessary just to hold the highlights, stop the highlights getting too bright um, and on that note if I may I'm going to turn the highlight warning on yes so you can see there is a warning even with it off if I turn it on and I've got this sound brighter I have actually increased the brightness there so has it in fact if we turn the warning off are those areas it's only we, clipping on one channel by the looks of it doesn't it I think that is exactly the point so let's turn it off again there's a little bit more text. I haven't lost much texture, and that's because I've probably used a brightness, but no, I've probably just accepted that there's quite enough texture still remaining. So I've, I've let the... Now, what, what brightness, and you can see this mainly brightness, this adjustment does, is it pushes the curve up from the middle. Yeah. So it's naturally getting slightly lower contrast at the top of the curve. Yeah. Does that make sense? So if we turn it on and open up the curve dialog and turn the brightness back you could go to a luma curve and just push it up that's the same below. effect almost yeah very very similar you could actually pull it back at the highlights a little bit if you wanted to so um, the idea really there is to is to mitigate the 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 
bad effects of the grad, which are that it, it actually tends to, you don't get quite the same sense of airiness. So if we turn it off again, mm. we can see how it's made it rather dark and foreboding. Well, that could be good if you wanted a dark and foreboding quality. Yeah. But I don't think I did. I wanted more that feeling of light. And is, is this because you've used the grad really as a technical tool to stop the camera clipping, not necessarily as a creative tool to create a heavy sky? Well, that's one way of thinking about it. Yeah, and a good way of thinking about it. Um, maybe, um, you know, in, uh, I, I would probably just come back a little bit and just, you know, want a balanced result. But I certainly didn't want it to, it to be, you know, if I wanted something that was really really did have a dark foreboding atmosphere I probably wouldn't have used those colors and I probably would have also done this so let's go to the vignetting tool and there is a bit of vignetting already but that will get you into a more kind of yes. gothic feel but you know that's not what it, that's not how it felt to me that is not the nature of that lighting um, so if we take it off now if you take it off completely it becomes a bit wishy-washy yeah it needs to be held and that's why I probably kept that the vignetting somewhere around there which would actually for me is quite natural looking okay so that was that one so let's uh, let's just quickly remind ourselves and go back to the browser and also the multi view that we're looking at those two Example. So we've gone from the right hand side to the left effectively. Um, now let's pick out another example, which is this one. Still, I'm afraid I'm going to keep repeating. And I hope you'll forgive me um, for for showing these pictures of, of this well-known view. But it's it's such a remarkable place. It is. It is one of the um, strange things about being on Egg is that view of Rum dominates the skyline in so many ways that it it sort of has to be used because it's very difficult to cut rum in half in a picture or to yeah. use a small portion of it or to exclude it completely. You're right to use the term dominant. It, it, it does, it sort of, dict well, actually, it, it's not so much dominant visually because it's quite soft here, but but it's so beautiful as a way of kind of, uh, of a, a looking at a space, the way that it, it defines it um, and draws the eye. Why would you not want to experiment and play with it? And, and so, um, in a sense, I... I I mean, I don't live there. I visit there. I'm lucky enough to visit there from time to time. And if you spend four or five days there, it, I think you see plenty of different lighting. It modulates the weather. I mean, the weather's yeah. coming in raw from the Atlantic there, so it does vary dramatically from it does you know, hour to hour. Let's have a look at the original raw file with no adjustments. Um, we're going to do that by turning the multi view off and uh, reduce it a little. Turn the toolbar off. It's pretty dark, isn't it? Is it? Dark. Yeah. It's yeah. um that that does give quite a full kind of foreboding type of quality and it's not really very well balanced. It you know, there's very, very bright patch up here. Yes. Um and so uh, and uh, one of the things I remember strongly at the time thinking particularly was beautiful was this little rock which is slightly backlit over here. Yeah. Um and you, you see the sort of shadow uh, that's caused by that bright uh, area of reflected light. And you can just see the shadow of the of the rock there, so that that's something that's kind of got rather lost in the dominance of the dark shadows. And presumably, it's it's quite dark because you've tried you've you've underexposed it slightly to hold that highlight at the top left, even even with a grad. Yes, yeah, exactly. So let's go back to the process version, and now it looks very different. Um, so I've obviously brought out the the textures and colours of the rocks. Um, whether that's too much, of course, well, we may well, or I might, I might change that in the future. But um, uh, it's it's given a, it's become a lot more approachable. It's less, um, what's the word, less dark and gothic. Um, it's still quite gothic, having said that, because I think that's the nature of those those rocks. Yeah. These are extraordinary erratics, and you know the water moving around them with a very high tide and whatnot. But I've taken that bright patch of sky right down. I've moderated the sky in here. Um, I've brought out the colours that there are there. And I, I've from for me, it's a closer reflection of how I remember it, maybe how the brain sees it, rather than how the raw file renders it. Yes. But the beauty of the raw file is it contains all of that data. 
So um, there it is. It's amazing, isn't it, to think that if we look at the, the code number 2946, it's the same. So that right-hand image allowed me to render that. Now, did it do it in a way that's destructive? Well, let's have a look at some of these deep shadows here. You might think with that being as dark as it is, it would be very difficult to bring out detail. But as it turns out, that's not the case. Yeah. All of the raw material is there. There's no sign of any noise. And, and so that's a, I think that, that helps illustrate the fact that modern digital sensors are remarkable instruments in terms of what they can deliver. So how have you, how have you gone about managing the, the, the very bright highlights, almost blown highlights in the, in the dark shadows in, the, in this particular image? Let's bring back the uh, toolbar or tool column on the right. Um, we'll go to a primary variant here and so we can really concentrate on this image. Um, and again, return to my kind of go-to column, which is the layers column. Uh, we'll see there's only one layer here which is actually just a sky. So what that suggests is that the vast majority of what I've done has been done with a mixture of, if we just look at the background first, because we've already just checked and we can see that the sky layer is, that's brought out texture and color. Yes. Uh, there, um, probably using a curve. Uh, let's just check the curve. We go to that layer. And yes, you can yes. see it's a luma curve which increases the contrast in there a little bit. And perhaps if we look at, no, it's nothing in exposure. Um, so that's that's pretty cool, actually, to think that the curve can do that much. But if we go now to the background, I think most of the work will probably appear in the color editor. You see that the advanced color editor has been quite dynamically used here. So if we turn this off, this one is that's interesting. That's bringing I must... out the orangey yellows, isn't it? Yes. So, but there must be more to so it. So, is it the shadow it. highlight? Is it's been used to bring a lot of the tone up? I think it. Well, we'll find out in a minute. And this is this control is basically fine tuning uh, the blues by taking the saturation out of them. So this is similar to the color separation you we were doing on um, room in the previous. Yes. Photograph. Okay, let's. Do, this is a really quite complex image. I, I'm realised now looking at it. So let's look at the main exposure module. So we're in the background and the main background layer. But look at the saturation. I've really, really pushed it up, 35 points. I've also pushed the brightness up, and I would have undoubtedly done some work on the white balance. So you can see that the white balance, the Kelvin slider, is well up to the right. That means I've. I've done quite a bit to um, mitigate the coldness of the original raw file. And I've also moved the tint uh, into the magenta area quite a lot, and then moved the saturation up. So if you were to take all those back to zero, you know, or normal positions, it would be much colder and much darker. I'm not going to reset the adjustments there. Um, I've also used brightness. So if we take that back, you can see it's pretty pretty dark. Yeah. Taking the brightness up has really helped to lift the shadows without blowing out the highlights. And what really surprises me is that this is, let me just check, that that has been managed somehow with high dynamic range. So essentially what I've done is used a lot of highlight recovery. Yeah. And if I were to double click this now, you can see that the sky goes a lot brighter. That's interesting. In, in Lightroom, I think if I'd have used a highlight recovery on that scale, it would have affected the whole image. And, and, and it seems to have only really affected the very, very brightest highlights I agree. in Capture I, One. I agree. I think that what the Capture One does have a slightly different approach mm. to uh, to looking at highlights to uh, to Lightroom. Lightroom tends to be much more into the ambient midtones as yeah. well. So um, that's worth, worth knowing. Um, now, it's not to say I couldn't have done it by isolating it locally. Clearly, I could have done so. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting difference that, that we see there. So in, interesting and perhaps slightly ironic that with an image that actually, when you look at the starting point and the finishing point, there's a big difference. Um, a lot of that is done by controlling color um, simply. And, and you can see how much greener and also um, colder the image is on the right compared to the one on the left. 
by controlling saturation, which has really brought out the warm colors, and then by using a little bit of shadow recovery here, and quite a lot of highlight recovery, and also, finally, the the use of the advanced color editor. Could, could we take the shadow recovery off to see how much that's made a bit difference? Absolutely. So, sorry. And there. Yes. Quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah. It's relatively small. That's a 20 point. It was recovery. 21 points. But it kept a nice balance of light in there as well. Yeah. It still feels quite organic. Now, what I always want to avoid is that feeling that it's starting to get HDR looking. Yeah. And if you max out the shadow recovery on capture one that's what you tend to get it's quite brutal a very yeah, yeah very horrible it's when, it's when things start to have their, their own internal glow it looks alien yes yeah it's much too much whereas where we were it's kind of still quite believable also i tend to have a printer's view of the world whereas i, I generally don't want blocked um or clipped shadows or highlights because then it becomes almost impossible to make a nice looking print uh, whereas it could still look quite nice on a on a um, backlit screen. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I might perhaps push things a bit further than than, than you would wish. Um, but just to remind ourselves, we'll put the, uh, the this highlight uh, warning on. And as you rightly said, that warning is for any color channel because quite clearly, if we look, this has got a big warning on it. But it's still got a lot of tone and color. Exactly. Yeah, and, and the real question is, does it look natural? Well, yes, I think it does. In fact, I think it looks more natural than that side hmm. where it appears burned out. Now it's using that quite small amount, well, not small amount of highlight recovery, yeah. but yeah. Um, it's done enough. So again, just to quickly remind ourselves. So what are the two color editor changes you've made? So let's pull this one uh, back and this one. And the color editor changes are in the make sure I've got a layer on. No, I'm on the wrong primary. There we are. Um, color editor. Uh, well, there's a large yellow red selection. And if I turn it off, we can see that that's mm. basically making the yellows and reds, the warm tones, a lot more active. So yeah. off, sorry, on rather, off, on. So it's, it's, it's brightened them a little bit and made them um, separate, made, made them slightly stronger. I'd say so. so there's no huge change there. No, there's so no huge more. change. If I were going to do a huge change, if we look at here, it's just actually quite interesting. When you look at the, just down at this little, these two little uh, patches, yes. the left-hand patch is as it was, the right-hand patch is as it is now. Well, you have to say that it doesn't look that different, um, but off and on, you can see the effect is quite significant. So the lightness going up pl uh, plus 30 is actually the primary difference. I think if we were to use much more saturation, it might start to look a bit strange or yeah. a bit obvious. And in fact, it's looking a tiny bit green. So if I were gonna do that, I might be tempted to, whoops. You can yeah. see when you do hue changes, you can really bring about a significant change in character or balance. So I might just leave a little bit of plus magenta just to take outside. out the slight green. Yeah, to take out the greeniness of it and then pull the saturation back to about, uh, well, plus, I think it was plus one, plus 10 or so. Yeah. Um, which is quite acceptable. And um, just to go back, so off and on. And then the other color, advanced color edit is this blue, which we can look at here. And it looks as if I've got minus saturation on that. So if we turn it off, yeah, you can see it's yeah. quite ambiently blue. Yeah. And what I think I've tried to do is create something that's more natural looking, yes. a little bit more somber in mood. Um, so ultimately, you know, how we, we describe it emotionally is very, very important. And, and, and this is where one will tend to keep coming back time and again, bringing slight adjustments, perhaps before you go to your final uh, PSD or TIFF file uh, from which you make the print. And this is interesting because I've, I've been looking at a lot of the um, VSCO plugins, which are the film emulation plugins for Lightroom. Right. Um, and if you look at the changes they make in hue, saturation, and lightness, um, the. Um, excuse me. Or hue, saturation, luminance, we, we sometimes call it HSL, which is essentially what our color editor is doing. 
then I'll strip this bit out. It's okay. Okay. Um, I didn't realise I'm the phone in here. There we go. So if we look at the way the film emulation plugins you work with hue saturation alignments or luminance, the they they boost the warm colours very often in saturation, but not the cool colours. Okay. And and that's a similar thing. Which is exactly which we're what seeing I've done here. there, isn't yeah. it? Okay. Uh, and I think quite often we 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 recognise too much blue saturation quite quickly as looking alien, whereas the warmth is, is, is more familiar. I think the other thing I'd like to say is it's a simple question of spatial separation. If we look at the right-hand version, um, it's dominated by the, by the tonal contrast of block, of dark and light, uh, and so that creates quite a kind of um, strong pattern in its own right, but it, it doesn't feel emotionally so connective or connected so for me the the bringing the yellows or the yellows out has brought the rocks forward in space mm. and the, the the cooler and now slightly desaturated tones um are receding and and that yes i suppose is if you like an attempt to emulate three-dimensional space yes okay moving swiftly on um the next one also uh phase one files is this extraordinary little slot canyon, as I think of it. Yeah, we don't get many sense. slot canyons in the UK, do we? No, <laughs> no, I mean, it's just an incredible bit of geology. Um, and I, 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 I've always, oh, I saw it for the first time back in 2003 when I went to Egg for the first time. Um, and I've always, it's one of those places that haunts my imagination. I mean, it's actually uh, the site of... A volcanic split of di uh, dike. There's, a, there's remnants of a dike further out, and I think it's a shrinking of the of the uh, metamorphosed sandstone that that's next to the um, the igneous rock, um, and that's then been worn away over the years by combination of um, that this fracture in the rock by water flowing down through it, and mm. and also big storms probably penetrating seawater up through it from time to time. Hence it's, why it's full of rounded sea pebbles. Yes, because that's, that's right. It gives this unique combination of, 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 of sea-worn pebbles and uh, river-worn pebbles or rocks. You can see at the back, this is, by the way, left-hand side, edited version, right-hand side, the raw file, or the original raw file. Um, if I double-click uh, to go to 100% at the back, you can see that ice uh, icicles formed at the back because this was... If we remember during that very cold period of February, um, the difference between these two is probably going to be a little bit harder to detect than previously. Most of what I can see is the the control of the highlights um, and, and and the light balance in the picture. I think. Yes, yeah. In, in a word, um, I think if if you look at the right hand one, it is balanced. So, right hand one, the highlights are quite bright on the right hand side. They're bright in the uh, in, in the highlights of the water. Um, what I've done is to try to change the balance by subduing the contrast in the water. Perhaps I've slightly overdone that, looking at it now. Uh, I've, I've, instead, I've subdued the rock on the right, and I've actually increased the contrast of the rock on the left, so that the, both sides of the canyon now speak to one another. So there's a proper sort of conversation going on. I, I feel that on, on the original raw file, it's quite flat on the left and it's quite it, it's too much on the right so now there's a there's a much more active relationship between the two sides of the canyon that might sound fanciful but you know you've got to have a way of thinking mm. um, i brought out light in the back of the picture so you see that the waterfall has had a little bit of luminance applied and that that draws the eye back and i think that's probably why i subdued the the foreground light on the stream as much as I did because I felt it needed that in order for the flow of light to move through the picture space into the back and that's my thinking if that makes sense yes so all of the adjustments are all there to serve a purpose in this case it's to move the light backwards more if you look at the original raw file the light tends to I think the eye in the end tends to dwell here yes um, rather at the at, at the expense of the waterfall and actually for me a lot of the kind of excitement of the of the memory is of seeing the waterfall at the back and the and the ice icicles 
So if we go to uh, single view a second, we can see the original raw file and then which fine um, but you, immediately and especially I think if we were to invert it, we'll see that dominance that I sort of hinted at earlier, which is here, so that the light, the light areas are all concentrated in this area. And now if we go to this one, the edited version, we can see that it's actually really interesting to do that because you realize, I realize now oh, there's a few things I could still do to it. But what it has definitely done is change the balance mm. in favor of the background. And I, I'd, I'd almost think, well, perhaps, let's see, I've got lots of layers in there. Um, layer one is lifting mm -hmm. um, that right hand or what is actually the left hand side of the image and that's probably just done with um, well it's saturation it says but that's probably also a curve in there uh, luma curve RGB curve no so how have I oh I beg your pardon I want brightness that's why um, so it's done with a luma curve so a luma curve which is a straight line curve preserves relationships but it brightens overall yes and it increases contrast but it doesn't change saturation if you use an rgb curve in the same way which i haven't done it will increase saturation and you get a color boost in the higher contrast areas yeah. correct yes so the higher the the more the contrast is increased so that's going to be in the bright tones particularly well i didn't want to change the color but i did want to change the contrast and the brightness so if we push it a bit further, and I'm going to turn the highlights on as well. Just let's watch that area. We'll go too far. You see that? Yes. So if we just go to the point where we start to see a little bit of clipping in the rock there, knowing it's probably only in one color channel. Yes. And now go to the icicles and just turn the highlight warning off. Has that retained texture? I would say yes. it has. Yes. So I probably can afford to push that curve a little bit further than I had. Not by much, but yeah. you know, just a little bit. So that's that's the thinking behind that. Um, let's go to layer two, which is a subduing layer. Wow, okay. So that's really, really darkened down the edges. And, and the water. And the water particularly. Yeah. And it's done that mainly with a luma curve. Let's just see if there's any highlights. No, I've left that. So that's just curves. So this is for, this should be, um, you know, music to the ears of Photoshop fans yes. who will know that curves is still the ultimate way, really, of controlling. It's nice limits. to be able to play with masks and curves again without, it is. without resorting to Photoshop. It is, absolutely. So just off and on. And then layer three is doing what? Look closely. Yes, it's a tiny little detail here. So off, just a bit bright. Yeah, darkening. No, just darkening, darkening it down. On the edge of the picture. Yeah, trying to reduce it. So obviously, okay, so here's a little philosophical quandary. A lot of photographers I, I know and respect greatly would simply say, well, I'm going to get rid of that, quote yes. unquote. Yeah. I personally prefer not to do that. I'd rather retain things that are imperfect and an irritant because for me, philosophically, that is what I saw, that was there. Now, I'm sure that one could debate it forever. I'd rather just, re I, what I don't want it to do is to dominate the picture. Yeah. So if I felt that was too eye-catching, that's exactly what I've done is I've just taken the contrast down. A big contrast change. I mean, it, it's really mainly that. In fact, looking at it now, I'd say I'd probably let the brightness back up to normal. I think the contrast down alone is probably enough. I think that I, I remember when it was off thinking, oh, it's just one of those things I wish I could get rid of it, but I mustn't get rid of it because I can't allow myself to, if that makes sense. So a little kind of philosophical, that's my position. I'm yeah. not saying that's right. It's just how I feel. I don't want to change materially what I've recorded, but I do want to edit it to change the emphasis. Yes, yes. Okay, um, right, coming back to full screen again, and I will make it larger for a second. 
and then our final layer is right at the bottom of the waterfall and it's just bringing that area out a little just to to give a bit more dynamic to it is that create the idea of the source of the light in there in the yeah. background a little yeah. bit yeah I mean it's still not as bright as the top of the waterfall mm. but it's just bringing it out a bit more so I think you know if we go in tight in here we can still see there's tons of light and contrast and colour in in the river but it's not dominating it as, mm. as it was so now if we go the right way around hopefully uh, we can, by the way, a quick full screen trick in Capture One is green button. Ah, okay, yes. So if you just really want to concentrate on what you did, and then you can either go back to the green button or press the escape key. So that's that's mostly what it's done is it's created a balance across the whole picture for you. Basically. And um, yeah, yeah. And again, if we go back to multi view, hopefully that will, in fact, let's do it this way. That confirms that. Yes. Does that makes sense. Indeed. And and ultimately it should create a more dynamic um result, but in a subtle way, so that it, it it's actually something you could keep coming back to and the eye can flow and move around it. Whereas the original, the balance isn't quite there. So you 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 constantly the eye is rather irritatingly coming back to that. Yeah. That's a tiny bit of water and the and the rock wall on the right. Yeah. Next, uh, now I think we're into our uh, Sony files, um, and we're going to look at this. Sorry, thank you. This one, um, which is uh, a puddle, frozen. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, the original is on the right. That's the unaltered uh, raw file. And the edited version is on the left, and you can see the color is virtually identical. Mm. Um, I, I, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I really like it because it's like it has got a figure quality for me, a slightly kind of bizarre, weird, cackling figure here. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Yeah. Smiling face, um, and then in the middle of it, there's a fa another face in here. Oh dear, what am I like? Um, can you see that? There's I a can, kind yeah. of mouth and an eye and a big sort of. Uh, nose, and then there's a there's a hand wrapping around the top the hand, of the, the fingers. Yeah. So it's it's all very kind of animated. I love that um, aspect of it. I mean, ice is amazing, isn't it? You know, yes. you can the, a puddle in the road in the track. It, it, it's got so much kind of imaginative potential. Well, if you're, um, I was I won't say smoking the right kind of drugs because I promise I don't do that. But anyway, I think that you know one should feel um, feel kind of. It's much more of a, for me a more of a childlike thing, you know. If if you if you can't still get excited about those sorts of things, we're hardwired for this, aren't we? Hardwired for recognising so. faces in clouds, and, yeah. and yeah. I think I think we sometimes forget about that as we get older. Yeah, and forget to yeah. play. And I think it's important to have that. That's right. That sort of play space. Uh, and and the, this particular capture one um, lesson is about about the fact that the original capture was particularly low contrast. And, and muted so yes. well, how do we deal with that yeah good question um, isn't it okay well look let's uh, make this our primary by clicking on it and um, one thing that um, that we can show right away is there's no layers so I've said mostly you know you like I like to th uh, think low uh, think uh, sorry act local think global well in this case I haven't even had to act uh, local at all um, because actually it's quite partly because it is quite flat also it's quite dark um, all the edges are dark I bet if we look at vignetting we'll see there's a vignette and it's almost a one stop vignette so just to make that clear yeah so yes I've darkened the edge you can double click to re zero it it's actually not that bad like that but I, I do think that I'm finding the stones on the left a little bit distracting so so that was the choice there um, Right, so let's have a look at uh, the fundamentals. The contrast is up plus nine, brightness is up seven points, uh, and there's no curve. And is that all I've done? Is it clarity, possibly? I think you're right. Let's have a look at clarity, because we haven't talked about clarity at all. No. Uh, but I'll bet there is some, and there's 100% 100 clarity. 100% clarity, yes. So there you are. Well spotted, Mr. Parkin. No, is that clarity working in a similar way to Lightroom? Do you think it has the same effects, or is it a different algorithm? Uh, it's different. Um, it's much milder. Mm. 
Uh, I think, no, I think that, if you're 100 in Lightroom, it would it, look it would very look, different. Yeah, it would. I, it's, it's probably plus 40 yeah. of Lightroom clarity. I think the same applies in the other direction. Um, what, one of my theories for that is that you can with uh, with Capture One, you can apply clarity uh, globally, and then if you even 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 if you max out clarity globally and you then use a local adjustment, clarity will still have value in it. That is not the case in Lightroom. So if you max out clarity in Lightroom, it's maxed out. You can't add any more locally. Does that yes, make sense? It does. So yes. I think that's a, that's a design decision on the part of the, I might be wrong, but that, that's my impression. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's relatively mild. And, and just to prove the point, if we double click on it, so we zero it, Yes. there it is. Yeah. Uh, also, if you go the other way, there it gives a slightly glowy feel but yeah. you know if you've done it in Lightroom 100% it'll lose left, any contrast it'll just look like a fuzzy blur really, yeah. pretty much so all the way to the right now let's ask ourselves does that look unnatural um, a second and I'll go to a single view I don't think it does no. all, all it is is it's a slightly enhanced version of normal human vision if we double click, it seems to have more of a sharpening, slight contrast and sharpening effect rather than a just flat edge effect it has in Lightroom. Yes, um, yeah, well, that, uh, yeah, I think that's right. Well, let's just hit the. Uh, uh, so this is our highlight warning, so that we can see there's a little bit of of highlight warning, but that's probably single color channel, so it's not problematic for us. Yeah, uh, coming up in the odd spot, but only tiny odd spot there. And so mostly the text has been preserved, but what now in with this clarity of getting you know wonderful kind of separation and detail coming through, which let's just remind ourselves isn't nearly as effective. Yes. Um, okay, so here's a thought. I've applied a little bit of contrast. What happens if we take contrast to the right? Totally different, isn't it? It's yeah. It's everything's all the lights have come up and all the darks have gone down with the contrast, which is what you'd expect. But it's uh, so it's, it's become too blocky. It's it's as if this is just a plain old ambient global adjustment. But when you use clarity, it's mapping like an unsharp mask. Yes, does where you have control of the radius. Yeah. Does that make sense yeah. if you're a Photoshop user? So let's just quickly do that again. We'll contrast back, clarity up. So it's it's a it's, it's not as extreme, mm. um, but what it's doing is it's applying it in a mapped kind of way. So we'll take the contrast up as well now, but do it progressively. You can see now that's it's quite a useful. Bit of that, yes. A little bit of that helps to get us into a, a punchier. I wouldn't say that in too sort of crude away but in a way that brings it more to life because that's ultimately all that matters is does it live on the page or on the print um, has it got an extra life I, I suppose this could be a, an image where you might think how does it look as a black and white that's okay but I quite like the color yeah. I, it sort of gives it its own you know the blue is the, the highlights are all blue and, and the shadows are all slightly reddish, yeah. which is counterintuitive. But then the blue is reflecting the blue of the sky above and and the, the whites are clearly more reflective than the surround. Uh, I, I like it with the colour. Definitely. It, it, needs, it needs the blue for me to, to feel um, like it's got the character of ice. You know, it's got a bit of variation across it and the tones of blue as well. Absolutely. Let us go to this one and rotate it, but I'm going to have to turn this. Okay, here's a little trick in Photoshop, uh, sorry, in Capture One, I should say. If you if you want a, a primary only, some of the controls respond together, are linked. So you can turn this uh, thing okay. off and yes. it unlinks them. Yes. And now we can see it like that. So here's our original on the right, rather flat, certainly not how I believed it could be in my imagination and, and so there it is on the left so very simple bit of vignetting quite a lot of clarity a little bit of contrast and hey presto very nice okay command b bring back uh, for our final image which uh, you particularly picked out is i mean it's more a phenomenon of nature really isn't it mm. um, below a waterfall um, uh, at the back of the beach 
A beautiful amazing. character, though, is the uh, the spray from the waterfall. Yeah, it's literally just um, you know how when when water falls and it, it bounces in an almost incredibly random pattern mm. all over the place. It, I'm I, I'm not a quantum physicist, obviously, but I always think, does this show quantum energy? Because water, when it when it explodes from a falling point, seems to be utterly random. Yes. Yeah, um, and it has coated everything in yeah. a consistent way around the whole area. Yeah, so it's it, like it's it encased in glass. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, it's um, it's all over the place around the base of this waterfall, and um, you can see that the dripping water beyond it on around the amphitheatre has has provided this kind of interesting backdrop with lots and lots of fascinating details, such as the little tree at the back here, which is very strange, fang like. Extraordinary, responding to, responding to wind mm. movement because this wind seems to be blowing down. Maybe it's coming with the water. I'm not quite sure what, what does it, or maybe it's a combination of as the ice gets heavier, so it starts to bend. Yes, yes, I can see that on some of the ones in the foreground where, they, where they've collapsed over, right? So, anyway, that that's so the original is on the right, the uh, edited version is on the left, and, and mostly I think I've push the color saturation up a little bit perhaps we'll just make sure that's our primary and look at the white actually we'll go back to our layers group well it doesn't say the saturation is gone it does say the contrast has gone up there and layers there are some layers let's look at the first layer okay so that's actually what I've done there is I've suppressed the highlights in the waterfall behind Simple reason to make the foreground come forward. Create a separation. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the second layer. Is it take the yellow out of those? Um... That's increase a ah, significant like, increase in like contrast a, in the that foreground. Like clarity. Pro yep, yeah. yeah, you're right. Clarity yes. plus sixty. And maybe is there any? No, there's nothing there. It's all the clarity. It's just clarity, really, by the looks of it. I'll just check the curve, just to see. No curve use, so that's just clarity, and I don't remember spending a lot of time working on this picture, mm. so I think there's still scope uh, to work on it. But well, we can see the the effect on the on the three dimensionality of the picture very, very clearly, very simply. Yes, using those simple tools. So um, hopefully that that is useful. The the phase one. So these are the last two have been the Sony files, and um, I, I will admit I probably haven't spend the same amount of uh, labor of love that I have on uh, some of the phase one files, which are the ones I probably had in mind to print first. But I think you can see that even with some quite small adjustments, there are powerful changes that, that can really help to bring the image to life so that when I do go back to them and say, I do want to print them at a later date, I've at least sort of started down that road. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Joe. You're welcome.